Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Wendy Weekly. And today I am delighted to welcome to the show um, a good friend of mine, a, a client of ours actually, called Dan Moorhen. And Dan joined my mentoring program last year and has just done phenomenal things. And I wanted to, to bring him in because uh, he's like probably many people uh, who are on the group or in the community right now who maybe are just starting their HMO journey. They've got some knowledge about property. They've done some training. They understand what it's all about, um, but they're committed to creating a great lifestyle from investing in property. And Dan is very much one of those kind of people. So, Dan, it's fantastic to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello. Pleasure. So, Dan, just to tell us, whereabouts in the country are you based? So, we're based down in Southend in Essex, uh, so the southeast. Um, and both myself and my, my wife work or used to work in, in London pre-COVID. So, we're um, the classic kind of both of us working on in the rat race um, up in the city. Right. OK, so that's that's really important context, isn't it? And I presume that that was, you know, was, was that one of the reasons why you thought, oh, you know, we want to get out of this. We want to create a different income stream for ourselves and our lives. Yeah, it was there's a, a couple of combinations, really. We've we've got two young children as well who are six and four. So as with a lot of parents, it, it's kind of missing out on that golden time, um, dropping early at childcare and, and picking them up late at child, uh, from childcare. Um, and also a couple of years ago, I was actually made redundant from from the job I was in. And it kind of highlighted to me that although there's there's lots of benefits to the corporate world, um, you are just a cog in the machine. And it's really just a, a mutually beneficial relationship that I'm using the company for, for my salary and they're, they're using me for my my intellect. And, and really, when that circumstance change or changes, you can be dropped at, at the kind of drop at a hat. And, and that was really an eye opener for me that I had very, very little assets that were that were generating any income. Although we were kind of doing well cash wise, we were we were doing the, the classic kind of trading time for money. And, and when that job disappeared, the, the income disappeared as well. And it's quite a shock, actually, at the time, isn't it? Because you feel that you've maybe contributed to that workplace. You've probably given of your time and energy quite significantly into that job. Certainly, I've known many people who have been made redundant and they've really given their lives to the job. Is that somewhat of how you felt? Yeah, it's um, so I, I, I was previously a, an underwriter in the insurance industry. And uh, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> so, it's a very kind of close knit industry and, and kind of very results driven. So if, if a company isn't making money, they have to make tough decisions. But when when management's making decisions at the board level, the personal ramifications for that and the, the impact it has on the people, I don't think is really something that they consider too much. And redundancy is a, is a widespread kind of issue and not just in London, but countrywide, especially at the moment. And I think for me, I've always considered I've, I've done well in my career so to be caught out and, and really left very exposed and looking at the cash we had in the bank and how long would that last us and, and until I found a new job it wasn't a very kind of pretty picture um, and, and really kind of highlighted to me that the cash element is, is only one kind of pillar of, of your financial security. So was that the moment when you decided right we've got to pursue a different strategy here? Yeah, I think we, as 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 a couple, as a family, and, and I've got two brothers that I work closely with as well in the in the property um, field. For us, we we were really into the the old school mantra of get a mortgage, pay your mortgage down as quick as you can, and and kind of be mortgage free at maybe if you're lucky fifty fifty five. And uh, I think reading various books like Rich Dad Poor Dad and The Richest Man in Babylon. For me, it was a bit of a light bulb moment that actually my my home is is a good source of equity to to get very kind of good access to very cheap capital in order to invest. And if, if it's costing me two percent per year, for example, on a residential mortgage, as long as I can then generate more than two percent a year, I'm better off doing that. Um, and it's it's kind of the the same paradox that people have ten grand in the bank, but they've got twenty grand on credit cards you're better off paying off that expensive debt with with your kind of savings that aren't earning much. 
So I think it, it was really a, a, if I don't if I don't manage to get another job in the in the insurance industry that doesn't match the salary I'm on, what do I do? Well, like my skill set is very insurance based, very kind of analytical and financial based, but the the market was going through a very tough period at the time and people weren't hiring and, and for me I needed that that alternative revenue stream. So with your analytical skills and your sort of financial skills, it sounds like what you were able to do is to really stand back and say, okay, we can use the the capital in our property, we can use the asset that we already have and leverage that and maximize it to create another income stream, which is you know something that you learn, don't you, as you as you start to do some more financial education, as you say, reading these you know amazing books. I think Rich Dad Poor Dad is probably the top of everyone's list. When they get started, it's it's a real eye opener that makes you realise what you can do. What what uh, what what kind of started you down the route of property and and in particular HMOs? Yeah, so my background in property goes back a, a couple of years before looking at HMOs. Really, um, my my mum and dad ran a business and, and sold that business a number of years ago and, and invested in some student HMOs um, in Essex, where where we're from, and they were really kind of very very well cash flowing properties and effectively it was it was for mum and dad to, to fund their retirement um to take that that kind of capital they made from the business and turn it into a, into effectively a cash generating asset um so we we'd had some exposure to to the the logic and the methodology of it to some extent already and i think i was spending yeah kind of two two and a half hours on the train each day going up into london and really started to get frustrated with not making a good use of that time. I was watching a lot of series on Netflix or, or Amazon Prime and really wanted to make the most of that because it was time that I was spending on, on a working day, really. I think that's really when I started looking into property blogs, um, different websites, more podcasts, and started to, I guess, educate myself in, in property um, to, to a, a larger extent, really. Started considering the, the kind of, vanilla buy to let routes new build buy to lets um, and in, invested in a couple of those with my brothers and then looked started to look at, at various other strategies as well so we've actually we've got one SA unit at the moment we did have a rent to SA unit as well um, and we're currently kind of considering um, buy refurbish refinance which I think it's good to get a, a good experience across different strategies but then it, it's really horses for courses for me, being in the southeast, I, I want to have a, a decent cash flowing portfolio and, and HMOs are really the, the kind of best strategy for that. But uh, and I guess also being in the southeast, the property prices are expensive. So you can't buy properties down here for 50, 60, 80 grand uh, and get kind of five, six hundred pound a month. It just doesn't exist. So for for us being in the southeast, our options were really limited. Buy to let is, is a tough one. And, and HMOs we kind of developed into um, realising that that was the best strategy for us if we wanted to replace our income. Great. OK, so so, so you, you were doing it from a very kind of um, analytical, but also you decided to, you know, an, an analytical point of view, but you also decided to sort of jump in as well and, and decide to get started, even though you knew that you had lots to learn, even though you, you were aware of lots of different strategies. Uh, so you started off investing with your brothers is that right Dan? yes um so we with with regards to my parents my, my dad unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago and, and we inherited the properties effectively so as a as three of us that were interested in property and we're, we're very close we decided to kind of club together and, and transfer those properties under a limited company um that meant we had three student HMOs under the property and we released some equity from those and really I think two years ago we were very much leaning towards the buy to let route I, I have a career myself I work full-time as I said both my brothers have finished a PhD in sports science and a master's degree in sports science so we've all spent a lot of time qualifying and, and building careers so we didn't want to give that up just yet maybe in the future we would do and buy to lets was really the, the kind of lowest touch, lowest hassle um, strategy that, that we could see that suited all of us um, because we all have different needs and, and kind of we're at different stages in our lives with 
we have children, my brothers don't yet. Um, so buy to lets was the, the kind of meet in the middle strategy that if we're investing and, and the ability to leverage that that deposit and, and multiple your, your return on capital employed versus stocks and shares, that was the best strategy for us as, as a compromise for all three of us. Now, once you've done a couple of those projects, what was it that then made you think, mm, I really now want to start moving into HMOs? I think we... I, I'm very analytical, so I'm a I'm a lord under the wealth dynamic. So spreadsheets are, are what I kind of work in day in day out, and, and bore my brothers with those as well. So I think we we had the HMOs, the student HMOs. We had the the two buy to lets and a couple of SA units as well. And it was really assessing those, doing a lot of financial analysis, comparing the yields, comparing the money left in as well. Um, and and with the buy to lets, we were we were buying new builds not really uh, able to add any value and the money that we're leaving in each time is, is kind of 60 70 thousand and it takes it takes a lot of buy to lets to, to then build up another pot of sixty thousand to go again the hmos were a, a much higher yielding um, had a much higher return on capital employed for us and, and the return period was kind of five or so years and that seemed a lot more realistic for us so in essence, it was how quickly can we reload and, and go again to get a new property? And, and HMOs really do that for us as, as a joint company. Um, for myself and my wife, we, we have a second company, which is just equity from our own property. And we wanted to do this together. And HMOs for us, professional HMOs, was the best route to get to our kind of target figures of financial security, financial freedom, and then what we kind of see is financial abundance, which is the next the next stage for that for that. Yes, fantastic. So it sounds like you were quite clear about what you were trying to achieve. Now, you don't have to give us a, an income figure, but but in terms of once you reach that figure, is the plan to leave your jobs? Is the plan to carry on working? What what would you like to ideally be able to do at that stage? Yeah, I think we've we've kind of given ourselves five years. We, we joined yours and Ian's mentoring program in October last year. Um, we then purchased our first kind of project in January um, and then got the keys at the start of March. So we're in the middle of a, a rip out um, on, on that property at the moment. I think we're, we're hoping that will be kind of ready to let in June and we'll refinance and then have the capital hopefully to, to then move on to project number two. We've kind of earmarked a, a five year period. Um, at which stage we would like to get to a stage where our, our net income from our two salaries, we would like to have matched that from property income. And at that stage, we would then be able to make a choice. Um, and I think really it's it's not that I would definitely give up my job, but it, it's I have the choice to, to, give up, um, to give up work. And I think our, our children would then be kind of 11 and 9, and it would be great to have the, the kind of possibility of either reducing my working hours or, or turning into kind of a project worker where I could have the summers off and, and take them away for the six weeks holiday. I think that's really my, my kind of goal is to have choices and, and time freedom, really. And I have to say, I mean, I've got my youngest son is 12 and it's been phenomenal for me. There's quite a big gap between him and the three older boys that I, I have. Um, and the three older boys were very much there in the sort of uh, the, the nitty gritty of me building my HMO portfolio. I'd often take them down to projects and they sometimes did even got out a paintbrush from time to time to help with some of the decorating and they had to really get their hands dirty. Um, but they were in their teens really by that stage, whereas Tom, who's the youngest one, uh, you know, he's come along with me many a time to property viewings and he's seen us build the business, but now he sees the freedom and the time that myself and my husband Andy have. And I do think it really changes your children's perception as well about what business is, what investing is, and it's, it's very, very powerful for the whole family. And clearly your business is very much centered around your family connections you're both you know you're, you're initially it was from your mum and dad then your brothers and now with your wife and maybe potentially with your children as well Dan yeah yeah and I think that the the house that we're doing up at the moment is is very useful as a <laughs> a, a kind of disciplining tool that they they get threatened they'll be sent to the other house if if they kind of misbehave. <laughs> yes. yeah, it, it is I think 
with yeah with kind of how family centric we are um the the opportunity to to build a legacy and, and that's really the the key for us is we we kind of have this opportunity to build a an asset base and a portfolio that that could continue to generate income long after we're gone and and hopefully kind of whilst we're still around for for many years to come and i i think it's a very common topic for people that are involved in in property that the this type of financial education isn't necessarily kind of it or taught in schools and colleges so i, I studied accountancy and economics and business so I have a very traditional kind of textbook education with regards to to that element, but leverage and kind of the the working dynamic of, of property and and how you can how you can operate within that. It's only people that that do it off their own back, whether that's reading books or podcasts or mentorships. I think it's quite a select amount of people within the population that that actually go that step further and make the effort and, and make the jump to, to educate themselves in something that isn't necessarily spoon fed to you at school and college. And I think that's a very interesting point. Actually, somebody's just put it in the chat panel. I'm afraid I can't see who it is. Um, we're in a similar position to Dan, working full time currently, but looking to invest in HMOs to build the cash flow base to give me some options and choices. And you know, isn't it that idea that you have you have that choice that that actually property gives you another stream of income to give you the opportunity to be free? But if you're in a job that maybe you feel is a vocation or it's something you've trained for, you might not easily be able to give it up. And and certainly there are people who invest in property who do have very busy full time jobs. But I think there's that as you said, it's really about the mentality. Uh, it's about the thought that actually I could give up my job if I wanted to or if the job gets worse or if I'm in a, a situation where you know, redundancy might be around the corner. Actually, it might be worth waiting for redundancy because you could get a nice payout. But, you know, let, let's just, let's let's imagine you're in a situation where you, you feel that the job has become too big, too pressured, too demanding. And you'd really like to have that choice. Surely it's better now you know, at your age to be building that as a as an opportunity rather than have it foist upon you where you have no job and suddenly no other income stream. So doing it at your age is, is you know, tremendous, Dan, and it certainly is going to provide that legacy, I think, for the future for your, your children as well and maybe your grandchildren, although that's a bit of a way off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it is. I mean, we, like I mentioned my dad before, but he, he, kind of built a legacy for for me and my brothers and unfortunately didn't didn't kind of last long after after retirement to to see that really come into fruition so I think we we wanted to not take what he'd left us and diminish it we wanted to we wanted to increase it so that if we if we inherited a pound we would leave one pound fifty that that kind of mantra and and hopefully our children would do the same and it, and it would build kind of a a, a big compounding effect over time i think as well I'm, I'm grateful that i've met people such as yourself and ian and, and various others in in the property community that really kind of help you to understand that compounding effect very early it is a slog at the start getting access to your first lump of capacity uh, lump, lump of um, capital uh, it's difficult putting yourself out there and, and getting angel investors involved or going to networking meetings when you are in the middle of lockdown you're homeschooling we got a puppy in july as well which was a silly thing to do so it, it's difficult to do that but i think it's that kind of pain now and, and the gain later and, and really benefiting from that compound later and we we see it that hopefully these this first project we're, we're kind of estimating it will it will net us around 13 to 1400 a month um being fairly conservative and if we can put that money back into the business, it, it means it's not long before we've got the next kind of lump of capital to, to invest again. And that's really the, the key for me is to get that snowball as big as possible, as quick as possible, because once you've then got two properties, it's then two times 1300 and then three times 1300. And very quickly, you see that that kind of the, the income from property starts to outstrip your, your, your corporate salary. I think maybe that's something that myself and my wife have, have struggled as well is it, it is very tough to walk away from from the London environment because it, it's a 
good op it's a good operating environment there's a lot of, there's lots of perks to it whether it's kind of medical insurance or critical life insurance pension contributions loans for season tickets there are a lot of benefits so it's not just replacing your salary it's also making sure that you've still got that additional income to to still protect your family as as much as you are in the corporate world and i think sometimes that's that's more of a difficult thing to to grasp is there's lots of stories of people that have replaced a, a lower income because obviously there's there's less, there's less income to replace but it, it gets tougher if if you're in a, a kind of corporate environment and, and maybe that's not what's sold on a lot of these kind of guru courses is kind of replace your income in six months it's not that easy for to do that for everyone i think it's a really good point because what you're saying is it's actually not just simply the income it's the the additional benefits that come with that job as well of course ironically probably you need that critical illness cover because the job is so stressful you're much more likely to get a heart attack in the age you know at the age of 50 whereas yeah. <laughs> if you're financially free you can choose to you know, have lots of exercise and eat more healthily and you've got time to do it. But A, that's a, that's a whole other research project, I suspect. Yeah. Um, so Dan, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to come on to your project in a moment because it's very exciting and, uh, you know, you're right in the middle of it right now. But I want to talk, talk to you, first of all, about your own mindset and, and also thinking about your peer group. Because what you're doing is really, as you said, it's, it's kind of going against the trend. You were brought up to get a good, get a good um, university education get a good job uh, get a mortgage pay off your mortgage and you're going completely against that trend how have your friends seen this clearly your family is of the same mindset but how has this you know how has what you've been doing affected your friendships or affected the people that you've been with have they been also challenged or what's been their reaction to what you're doing yeah it's um it's mixed really i think there's there's some friends that always want you to do well and and kind of see see you take opportunities and and kind of make the most of them and they're pleased for you and then some some people kind of don't believe it or they're they're a bit more skeptical and really for for me there's there's friends of mine that potentially I, I would look to invest with in the future but for me, it, it was really critical to do the first project um, off my own back with, with kind of equity that we'd raised from our, our own home um, so that I could then kind of sit down with a potential investor in the future and kind of look them in the whites of the eyes and say, well, look, this is a proven kind of methodology. Here's what I bought the property for. Here's what I did to it. Here's the cost and here's how I refinanced it. Uh, I think that that's kind of the key for me is to have that that integrity and that skin in the game. Um, it's it's kind of very rife that lots of people say oh, I'll offer you twelve percent return, and if you if you drop a hundred grand into my bank, which it's not, there's lots of kind of pitfalls in in that in that kind of method. Um, I think really, yeah, some some kind of some of my friends are in the trades or they're landscape gardeners, etc. So actually, it's great because I can I can put a lot of this work their way um, and, and know that they're good friends. Sometimes that's challenging if there's a, a disagreement or the work isn't up to scratch. But if you're if you're good enough friends, you should be able to have that kind of constructive conversation. So yeah, some people are, are they're benefiting from it as well as me because they've got regular kind of big project work to get involved in. And then some people um, have potentially different political views to me and view landlords as the big the big kind of monster that steals houses away from children. So that's that's kind of a wider a wider consideration <laughs> it is it, it is i think it's uh it it's not and i think people that don't understand it and don't understand the offering and, and the opportunity that you're you're giving to younger people that potentially couldn't afford a property of their own or they don't have the inclination to save up a deposit people need to have shared accommodation they, they want to have shared accommodation um, whether it's kind of a younger person who just wants to be out of the house with mum and dad after lockdown because they've all spent too much time with each other or people that want to live close to the, where they work but, but can't find a, a property to buy or people that just want the social element of it as well. So I think friend, friends will either support you and, and kind of acknowledge what you're doing or potentially won't quite, dis won't quite agree with what you're doing but that's, that's everyone's opinion, isn't it? 
So it sounds like your mindset has also developed over the time that you've been an investor. You've, you've become clearer about your thinking and clearer about your aims and objectives. In what other ways do you think you've, you've developed a, a better mindset? I think patience is patience is very key. Um, I, I could potentially be a bit fiery um, in my younger days up in London and, and kind of learn to curb that because it, there's often a, a constructive kind of reason behind why someone has done something. I think my, my dad was very much into the kind of workings of Dale Carnegie and he he always said the only way to win an argument is to is to avoid an argument. So I think the patience to, to deal with mortgage brokers, lenders, um, your builder, your tradespeople, vendors, estate agents, ultimately no one else cares about your property as much as you do. So to expect them to put in as much effort as you are is is almost a folly really and, and you must understand that the, the estate agent they don't really care if you don't hit that stamp duty deadline because it doesn't come out of their pocket or the builder might not necessarily be too worried if you don't hit your first of june deadline because he's not the one that misses out on the rent so i think that that's a big key is to appreciate other people's perspectives and have patience with other people um but i think really when where we went two years ago and invested in buy to lets if i knew then what i knew what i know now i would have potentially not done that but there's still cash flowing assets that are generating us an income so i think it, property is a very forgiving industry and and kind of the best time to plant an oak tree is 25 years ago but the next best time is today and also having that goal in mind kind of what what is it you want to achieve do you want to be an investor or do you want to be a landlord because they're two very different things hmo is very much more hands-on whereas buy to let is is easier to leverage out that responsibility to a managing agent so it's very key to understand your goals and the best analogy i've heard is is kind of when you get in a car you know where you're going to you don't get in a car and then decide where you're going to you, you need to know what what your destination is before you begin the journey really so I think that that's it is is clarity of mind and, and having a, a goal in mind and, and aiming to get to where you want to. Great. OK, that, that that's that's brilliant. I, I, and I, I think that's very wise advice is very, very sound for anybody who's watching today to thinking, what is it they actually want to achieve? What's the goal? Uh, and really thinking deeply about that and understanding what that means for them. Um, not thinking too hard so you get into analysis paralysis, but certainly enough so that you can actually start to decide which is the right vehicle to get me to that destination. Now, Dan, we've, we've got a question from somebody uh, about the finance on your HMOs. So how have you, have, how have you financed them? Uh, have you used private investor finance? And what are you going to do at the end of this particular conversion project? You might want to give us a little bit more information about the, about the refo project itself too. Yeah, so we, um, we saw the property uh, middle of December and kind of moved fairly quickly on it. I, I, the key really for me was to be able to buy um, in cash and to have the cash to do the refurb project. And really the, the logic there is, A, it's a much, much quicker process. So we could we could sell that to the, the vendor and say, look, we're, we're a cash buyer. We can complete on this kind of in a matter of weeks. Whereas if it's a, a buyer that needs a mortgage, it, 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 at the moment, we're still doing a couple of mortgages that have been ongoing for six months. It's just a nightmare at the moment with finance companies. So buying cash was was key for us. And we, we released um, a significant amount of equity from our property, our residential property. And then I, I did use a private investor. Um, I kind of feel that it was cheating a little bit because it's my mum. <laughs> <laughs> But mum, mum had kind of some some cash that was sitting in ices, earning kind of half a percent or one percent a year, and I looked at it and said, "Well, I I need an extra. It's one hundred fifty thousand that we've borrowed from my mum, um, and we've offered we're paying her a six percent, uh, sorry, a four percent interest rate. So mum's getting a multiple of interest rates versus what she would get in the bank." we get access to what is much cheaper finance um, versus a, a bridging loan or a, or a mortgage. And it means that we can buy in cash, fund the refurb in cash, and once it's finished, we can then get a commercial valuation and hopefully pull as much of that money back out of the, of the project as we can so that we can reload and, and go again. 
Excellent. I think for our projections, we're we're estimating to leave around fifty to sixty thousand in the in the project, but with with a cash with a project that that's cash flowing kind of thirteen to fourteen hundred a year, with the savings that we put in each each month into the business, it won't it won't be too long before we can do that again, or we can make up that sixty thousand with a bridge, which is a lot cheaper than using a bridge for one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, absolutely. So you, I can see you've really thought about the maths, you've thought about the movement of money. And I think you're right that giving using cash is is a lever when it comes to making offers, when it comes to securing deals. Uh, not always easy for everybody. And, and But I think it's also good to hear that you've you started the process of raising funds, learning how to raise funds from other people. Again, through them looking at what they're getting currently in the bank and even more through an ISA and what you can potentially offer them. Um, you know, okay, it might be your mum. Most of us start with our family and friends when we first start to, to, to raise finance because they're the easy ones to kind of practice on. They're the easy ones to, you know, if you get it wrong, they're very forgiving. Uh, and you can, you can, you know, you can, you can kind of put things right as you go. Um, whereas when you start to meet other investors, you've obviously got to be a little bit more careful and abide by FCA regulations and so on. So, you know, Dan, you shouldn't feel bad about that. that that's still a great achievement and, you know, great, great um it's great for your mum to have the money that she can she can lend to you so that that's phenomenal as well yeah. so and i'm sure also there's an element in which she's thinking oh good i'm helping my son to you know in increase his property portfolio yeah i mean she to to some extent yes but i think the the primary benefit for her was that the interest pays for her and her partner to go on a cruise <laughs> at the end of yes. the year um, <laughs> so that, so that, that's effectively when when it was phrased that way that mum was saying i mean four percent interest on 156 grand a, six grand a year in a 12 month period so she kind of said so so every year i can go on a cruise paid for by just lending the money to you and said yeah like that it is it is as simple as that so yeah there's she has an ulterior motive um to this but um it's it for her yeah it's it's good to be able to be involved in in what we're trying to achieve and for me, as I said earlier, the key is to do this primarily funded off of our own equity release, also borrowing from a private investor, although it's still within the family. But it means that when I go to, to external investors, this, this project is funded primarily by myself and my wife. So we've put our neck on the block and kind of made the, the, the kind of hard yards on it so that we, we can then have some empirical evidence as it were we've we've got our own case studies to say to investors look we bought it here we we took 12 weeks to do the refurb we spent this much we refinanced it this was the valuation what we're looking to do is effectively rinse and repeat would you like to be involved and, and we can offer you a four to five percent return on your return on your investment at, annually and i know from speaking to yourself and, and others that once you have an investor where you continually give that money back to them or give them the interest on a monthly basis, they, they're quite happy to leave that cash with you um, and then to rinse and repeat the process effectively. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about the HMO that you, you bought, Dan. What was it and what are you turning it into? Yeah, so it's um, so it's a probate property. Um, so it'd been a, an elderly gentleman who'd lived there for a number of years. Um, it's a very, very kind of, nice large victorian property um, right in south end town center so uh, as with most kind of towns and cities we've got rows and rows of, of terraces but they're the great old victorian properties big high ceilings huge living room and dining room downstairs um they're kind of built built very very kind of well solid brick walls throughout so it's it's currently a three bedroom property um, three bedrooms upstairs. We are converting it into a five-bedroom, five ensuite HMO. So we will have the living room and the dining room downstairs will both be bedrooms as well. And then the current utility and kitchen area will be a, an open plan kind of kitchen, diner, uh, living room. Um, yeah, so that that really is is kind of what what we're converting into, and, and we'll kind of do some work on the garden and, and make it a nice kind of shared living space out the back i think for us where we are we we've got great transport routes into south uh, from south end into london 
uh, we're on two major train lines so where we're located is, is kind of very close to both of those train lines so whether people need to go into Liverpool Street or Fenchurch Street we're, we're kind of in the middle of, of those two train stations and for us because we're going for professional HMO on suite for us was was a key key metric um, I think there's there's more and more competition in the market and for us we wanted to be at the top end so that even if we I'm very keen on protecting ourselves against future future issues if there was a significant drop in HMOs um, or demand for HMOs we could be, if we're in the top 25 percent of, of HMOs in our area we could see a reduction in demand by 75 percent and still fill our HMOs so that's for me, I think the redundancy for me meant that I'm always looking for contingency and, and kind of protection for the strategy. And being in the top end of, of the HMO market for me was was really that that kind of method, really. Well, you're also in the indus- in the insurance industry, so you you're always thinking about uh, worst case scenario, really, aren't you? Yeah. And what could happen and contingency. That that's that sort of uh, meat and potato, bread and butter to you, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it. Now, a um, question that somebody's asked is, did you get much of a discount when you were buying for cash? Um, vendors are still wanting top price regardless of cash or mortgage is what they're finding. What, what about you? Did you did you get much of a discount? Yeah, so the, the property was listed for 260000 Um It wasn't on the market for very long when we went to view it. I think it had been on for about a week. And we offered 245 and settled at two four seven five hundred, so we got twelve and a half grand off off the asking price, and I think I I kind of phrased this that we this was middle of December at the time the stamp duty holiday was was ending at the end of March, I I kind of phrased it that if the vendor doesn't go with a cash buyer, then it's going to be someone obviously using a mortgage. And the likelihood of, of the purchase completing before the 31st of March was was pretty much nil. So just phrased it that does the vendor want to be in a position that come 31st of March when the deal hasn't gone through, their purchaser with a mortgage could potentially pull out because now the figures don't stack up for them. So just almost use that, that kind of scarcity tactic of cash is king. We've got cash. Here's the offer. We can complete as soon as your, your solicitors can complete the paperwork. And and yeah, for them it worked. It was um, kind of a, a couple of children whose whose father had obviously passed away. To get a quick resolution and cash in the bank fairly quickly for them was was why they or they were motivated sellers effectively. Potentially, it's it's painful dealing with their father's old property, and they just wanted a, the issue to be closed. So we looked at that, and and that the opportunity for us to to pay cash meant that it was a a quick process for them, or, or quicker than it would be with a mortgage. Fantastic. And then what about the budget for the refurb? Uh, did, did you have you also paid for that? Did you pay for that from your mum's money? Uh, or, or was that also from the, the cash that you had from your uh, refinance on your own property? Yeah, so that's that's a mix, really. Um, and that's, you know, we've, we've kind of put all of our money and, and the money we've borrowed from my mum in, into the, the comp or into the business. And yeah, whether that's kind of to pay for the purchase or the refurb, it, it's all now in the mix together. Um, but yeah, cash for us um, paying the builder. Actually, we've we've just completed a refurb on our own property, hence why we had it revalued, and we're using the builder that we used on our property. So we've we've been dealing with him for the last kind of six months already, um, and got a very good relationship with him. I think something that builders and tradesmen really appreciate is, as much as we're expecting high quality work from them, there is a high quality service that we need to give them. And, the, and that is being clear and, and kind of detailed on our product spec, but it's also paying them on time. Those guys, are they're juggling kind of lots of cash coming into their business and, and flowing out again because they're paying for labourers or paying for plasterers, buying materials. So for us to discuss with our builder, how much money do you want up front? When do you want the rest of the money kind of payment intervals? And for us to, to make sure that we're good to keep to those intervals is just as important as it is for him to keep up his quality of work for us. So I think it's as much as we expect high quality from our our trades and our partners, we we need to hold ourselves to those high standards as well, which having the cash in the bank is key for me. 
I wouldn't want to be waiting for a mortgage or a bridge to hit my bank in order that I can pay my bill down. That's a great point. I think that's a great point. And that's the way to build a great relationship, isn't it? Where you both trust and deliver. And that way you're, you're both happy with the way it's working and, and how that, that relationship is constructed. Yeah. So in, ter in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the budget for the refurb, Dan, what, what's, your, what's your budget? <laughs> Seems to be a blank check. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've, uh, we have a quote from him of around 90,000, um, which there's some elements that we're looking to kind of reduce that on. So he, for example, he quoted to tile the, the bathrooms from, from floor to top. And we're probably going to only tile kind of half the bathrooms. So there's a saving there. Uh, there's also, he's priced in some decorating work and landscape work. So we would look to use our own kind of decorator and landscaper for that. Potentially, we're, we're going to be cheaper there. But then there's some elements that we didn't necessarily consider at the start. So he's had to take down all of the ceilings, all of the plaster um, on the ceilings because that had suffered a lot of water damage. So we I think 90,000 is, is roughly our figure at the moment, but it's yeah, subject to, to change. And I think for me, I've, I've always got a 10 to 15% contingency in there. Um, nothing, whether it's your own property or a development property, nothing ever comes in on budget or within the time frame that you expected it. So I think if you expect it to take longer and be more expensive, then you might be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> But yeah, so, roughly ninety thousand. Yeah, and that sounds fairly realistic. But I think, as you say, what you're trying to do now is to pinch little bits off it so that you can reduce it down. And that's always a very, very good approach. And it's something that obviously we teach on the mentoring program is how to really assess the cost of your budget so you don't have surprises. To do that specification in detail, but also before you even go ahead with working with the builder, really looking at that quote and saying, well, can we take that out? Can we take that out? You don't want to compromise it too far. And obviously safety is paramount, but there are certain tricks and tips that you can use that really help to reduce the cost of the refurb. And also yeah. I think help to make it more of a future-proofed investment for you long-term as well. So mm -hmm. there might be some things that you actually increase in terms of your investment in the property, but actually long-term, they decrease your time involvement. And I think that's something that perhaps not everybody thinks about, but certainly, you know, one of the things I've learned on my journey is how important it is to make sure that you're thinking about the next five and 10 years when you've got an HMO, not just the next year. And uh, so, so that's something that I'm sure you'll be doing as well. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's, some damage to the external render on the on the front for example and i mean he, he said look i've i've kind of budgeted to to patch it up and and paint over it and, and make it all look nice but realistically that section of the render it's it's suffered from some damp because the guttering is blocked above it the best thing to do is is to kind of chip that render off and, and redo it from scratch which is an extra cost but if we don't do it now then in a couple of years time we'll only be doing the same job that we've just done and and then it's more difficult because we'll have tenants in situ so i think it is like you say it's, it's putting in the extra effort now that it, it makes your property as robust as possible uh, and kind of as as sturdy as possible because if you've got five people living in a house together it, they, they do get little knocks here and there and, and you need to be able to repair it fairly quickly i mean some something that he's suggested to us that is different to what we would have done um, in our own property. We've we've put in kind of shower um, shower or um, wet room type showers, and he's he said look they're they're great for your own residential property because you look after it. But in an HMO, a wet room is a lot more difficult to look after than a shower tray. So that's just where if we were left to our own devices, we maybe would have gone down one route. But actually, with his experience in in maintaining these properties and kind of the maintenance issue it's good to have some input from people that, that deal with that day to day not True. not kind of having integrated showers and pipes as well just having that exposed so that then it, it's easy to repair rather than having to take the tiles off the wall for example very good advice very good advice and, and that's where the advice of a good builder is really priceless it is and i think T touching on the the kind of refurb cost it was it was above what we potentially 
had estimated ourselves and we we had another quote that was around 10 percent cheaper but we we know the builder he's done a great job on our own property we've got that element of trust and, and the relationship there and i think I, I kind of asked the question to to yourself and um ian in a mentoring session would you pay a bit of a premium to have kind of the the pre-existing relationship and the answer was yes because you've got that you know the quality of their work and you've you've already had some difficult discussions with them previously so if he's done something that wasn't quite what we wanted we're comfortable to have that discussion with him yeah true true so dan can i ask you and i don't, I don't know it's, it's probably hard for you to give an unbiased opinion because i'm the one doing the asking but i would really like to know since you've been on our mentoring program how has it affected the way you work your 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 views about hmos and your results yeah it's i mean it's I, I also did when we ran our we had a rent to SA unit as well and I, I also did a mentorship program um, a, with a, a, an SA operator so I think it wasn't as difficult for me to, to join the mentorship with you because I'd already done it and, and seen the value in, in mentorships I think it whilst a, a few thousand pounds it is it is a big amount of money when you're thinking about what you spend day to day but when you're when you're kind of in the property industry, you're you're buying properties, as I've just said, for two hundred and fifty grand. I'm spending a hundred grand on the refurb. So adding in a few thousand pounds for a mentorship is not a, a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. And if it saves me five grand in mistakes, or it saves me a lot of time because I can lean on the community and I can lean on yourself and, and Ian and their expertise, then it pays for it, it pays back for itself. And once you've paid that kind of saving back, then your your return on investment is then is then infinite. I think it's I, I'm as I said I'm a lord, so I definitely suffer from paralysis uh, analysis paralysis. I I will look at a spreadsheet for for hours on end and then decide I need some more time and I'll, I'll pick it up again tomorrow. And I think being part of the mentorship and, and the support network around means that. I mean, luckily, Ian, your your kind of colleague, is is based in Southend as well, and he he viewed some of the properties with me as well. And for him to be able to go in and say, "Yeah, no problem to put an ensuite there. This is a great space for a kitchen and a dining room." To have someone with that that experience and the expertise, it just gives you the confidence to kind of take the plunge. And and that's really the biggest challenge is you can read books listen to podcasts listen to these lives post on facebook but taking the plunge is is the biggest challenge kind of standing on the edge of that bungee that bungee platform and actually doing it and <laughs> maybe it's not the best, <laughs> best analogy but having a mentor is the person that pushes you off that ledge <laughs> and, and makes you take the plunge because you, you've got the confidence to do it you've got people around you and i think day to day it's it's just very useful when you've got very detailed questions that are specific to you so I'm, I'm posting in our whatsapp group do i use nest or do i use hive do people have um pressurized boilers or unpressurized how big do you have your bathrooms do you provide tvs in your rooms should i be considering kind of um, hardwired internet for for people that work from home these days just endless questions that pop up anytime during the week or anytime during the day that if you didn't have that support network, you'd have to then go away and spend hours researching yourself. And, and the, the templates that you guys have, like product specs, um, refurb kind of schedules, contracts for builders, uh, HMO templates, all of that stuff would just, it would take you a lot more than five than £5,000 worth of your time to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's the real benefit is a time saving. Your, your time is valuable and for me to be able to rely on the network and to rely on the mentorship to enable me to go and view properties or meet the builder that's that's in my opinion money money very very well spent that's great well i have to say it's been a pleasure also to have you on the program dan because you're an action taker and it actually hasn't been too hard for us to get you to to take action and 
it, what's been really interesting for me is, of course, at one point you had a bit of a dilemma over two properties that you were viewing. You were buying one and then another great one came up and, you know, you needed some support over making a decision over those. But I think that, you know, ultimately you've now got this fantastic project underway. You're already starting to see some results. You're thinking now about your second property. Um, given that you are a lord, I'm sure that you'll be systemizing it all in the background so that the next one you can use the this cookie cutter approach and rinse and repeat it. And it's not going to be long before you're going to have a really nice handful of HMOs giving you great income. And as you said earlier, choice. And, and that's what this is really all about is choice and freedom. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it is. I think the mensch is just you. You asked about kind of my friends' opinions and and people or people around me their opinion, and and a lot of people are skeptical because they don't believe it or they don't they don't know anyone who's done it. But being in a in a mentorship group, you're you're surrounded by like minded people that want you to succeed, and they they want you to succeed because then they can kind of steal a little nugget of information from you. But also because they they've also succeeded themselves. So I think surrounding people with with this, a similar mindset that typically is a positive kind of action takers mindset is is invaluable. Really, it's um, yeah you're, you're kind of only the sum of the people that you spend time with, and and really having other people that are enthusiastic and interested in this is, is key for me. Fantastic. Well, Dan, uh, we're very excited to watch you over the next few months as well to still be involved and, and help you handhold you when you need it and other times let you get on with it. Um, but you're, you're a great contributor to the group as well. And we really value your input and your enthusiasm for all things HMO. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you know, it's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, I think for, for anyone, I, I would say it's it's money very well spent just to have that support, the time saving, and just whether you want to view them as friends or colleagues or associates, but people that can just give you that little bit of reassurance when, when potentially you need it. Because parting with 10, 50, 100,000 pounds or more to buy properties, it's a tough decision to, to make. Most people have that mantra of, I'll put it in my pension and I'll get a three percent return on it, and then it will be there in sixty when I'm sixty-five. That that's a valid way to look at money, but for me, the, the compound effect of property and having the control over your own money is, is is key. And I think being in the corporate world, we we experience a lot of corporate waste. A lot of people kind of hide in the corners and take their salary home. So the opportunity for me to bust the gut and really put the effort into HMOs. Or, or buy to lets or whatever the strategy is but the more you put in the more you get out and if i put in loads i get in i get out loads it's not anyone else benefiting from this and that i think that's why people see the attraction of, of, of property is you are you are what you eat in a way and, and the more you put in the more you get out whereas in the corporate world sometimes you're in a team of 20 30 and you've got 10 people also putting in the effort but 10 people not and that that's a big frustration Mm, yes, yeah, true. Well, it'd be interesting to see what happens eventually, what you do decide to do. But in the meantime, we wish you all the very, very best, Dan, in your endeavours. I, I know it's going to be a great success and we're really looking forward to seeing those results as they come through. And yeah. please don't forget to post pictures up into the group when you've got them, because we always love to see a newly refurbished HMO. <laughs> There's lo lots of messy pictures at the moment. Chimney stacks. Yes. Too. <laughs> <laughs> those are good too we like those too yeah no, great stuff well listen thank, thank you for being on today really great to hear about your your story dan and uh, learn how you've done it um, and we'll, we'll take a keen interest in uh, the next few months and the results that you get thank you for your time today right see take you care. soon bye bye, -bye.